स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello and welcome once again to the lecture series on cultural studies. As you are aware, these uh, lectures are being recorded under the aegis of the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, which is a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. You will recall that so far we have um, by now, we have completed the first module, which as you uh, would recall was introductory uh, in nature. And we have already moved into module 2, which is to do with key concepts that are used in cultural theory. These key concepts enable us uh, and enable us to uh, uh, be, uh, to be able to apply the theories uh, given any cultural situation. Uh, we shall now do a quick recap of what we did in the last lecture. Before that, let us look at uh, the key concepts once again, some of these that are being discussed in this module are subjectivity, representation, ideology, power and identity. We talked about uh, subjectivity in our last lecture and you would recall that subjectivity is not simply a state of being or a state of being a subject. Chris Barker calls uh, subjectivity or, uh, or he uh, delimits the scope of subjectivity by using three terms. These are A, subjectivity is a condition of being a person, which is the state that I had referred to just a while ago. But subjectivity is not simply a state and as Barker says, sub subjectivity could also be seen as a series of processes that go into the construction of being a person. Third, subjectivity is not simply a state or condition, nor is it just a series of processes of becoming a person. It is also, it also includes the study of the experience of being a person or the experience of one's subjectivity, okay, of say what it feels to be a person of a certain kind. Identity, we saw, was a seminal concept that is used in cultural studies and uh, no, um, uh, well, no other concept really or no other domain of cultural studies it is held may be studied without identity. Identity, if you look at this slide, lends itself to study of class. For instance, what is one's class identity? The study of ethnicity, which is as you all know, um, a topic of much debate, okay, uh, of much assertion by different ethnic groups. So, what is one's ethnic identity? In the same way, identity also lends itself seminally to gender. Okay, what is one's gender identity? How is one identified? Okay, as a gendered person and what does that identification entail or what does that identification tells you to do. Fourth, we look at this slide, once racial identity is also seminal or central to an understanding of one's own self. Okay. You will also recall and which I maybe will talk about again, remind you once again that there is a difference between subjectivity and identity. 
Among other things, one's sexuality, one's sexual orientation is also an identity. Okay? Uh, so, we see that there are several areas, not just these five that we have talked about just now, uh, on which the, the topic of identity okay, impinges uh, very, very strongly. We also found in our discussion in, in uh, this module that identity is at once a framework okay, and it is also external. It is a framework in that within the framework of identity, one is supposed to or one, uh, one more or less ends up um, developing one's own identity okay, and find and also eventually subjectivity. How is identity external? Identity is external in the sense that identity is at least when compared to subjectivity, identity is something that is given to you from the outside. Okay? It is from the society that tells you what your identity is. Uh, this is what I had mentioned a while ago, if you look at the two words subjectivity and identity. Okay, we discussed that subjectivity is the constitution of one as a subject and it is it deals with how we experience okay how we experience ourselves remember we had said that it is not simply a matter of being a person but also how we are constructed the processes and the very experience of being a person that is central to the concept of identity oh, sorry of subjectivity on the other hand identity is of course how we see ourselves Okay? That's, uh, in this case, we are not talking so much about how we feel ourselves, okay? feel or how it feels to be a person, okay? the inner life, but how we see ourselves. And look at this slide, how we see ourselves okay? is deeply intertwined in the case of subjectivity with how others see us. Okay? So, how, look at this, how we see ourselves, how you see yourselves. Okay, within this cultural theory, how you see yourself is determined to a considerable extent by how others or how society or the socio-cultural situation milieu uh, sees you. Okay? So, um, I, 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 uh, we are looking at these two, uh, these two terms so that you know, it will be easy for us as we move on when we talk about other terms, okay? it is easy central. Uh, to this discourse to keep the, the subtle difference between these two topics in mind. Uh, identity solves also self-identity or what we call verbal conceptions of ourselves. What do we mean by verbal conceptions of ourselves? Okay? We saw in the last lecture that identity is a way Okay, this may be defined as a way of conceptualizing ourselves okay, through the verbal medium. Right? That is through that is through words. Okay? So our self-identity, our understanding of ourselves is how we conceptualize ourselves, how we articulate it. The moment we articulate ourselves, our self-identity, we are using words and we are using a certain discourse. If you remember, we did look at the word discourse and we will be looking at the word discourse again in, in uh, uh, a couple of um, lectures from now. Okay? To therefore, to define yourself is uh, your self identity is to use certain words that proliferate in a certain discourse. This of course, the moment we talk about discourse, Okay? We are automatically drawn to the social because it is the social that gives us the language. Okay? We, are, um, uh, we, we, uh, we are socialized uh, or we, are, we become social beings largely through the medium of language. We are understand ourselves, we understand others through the medium of language. Okay? So, social identity is what we call others okay what we call others opinions or views of us 
others opinions of ourselves. The point to be really uh, uh, you know, uh, to, do, uh, to be really noted here is how the social and the private or the personal or the individual interrelate. Okay? We know now that our understanding A of ourselves, okay, our self identity depends on language and on words therefore, on a discourse and that discourse is given to us by society. So, what does it mean? It means it means that we cannot have a conception of our own identity in isolation. Okay? We cannot have um, you know, uh, what we call a solipsistic or a closed world in which we understand ourselves. Our understanding is deeply informed by the understanding of ourselves is deeply informed by the understanding or by what we may even say this is the word that we use the gaze okay? or the look the look that is given to us by, uh, by uh, our social identities. Okay. You will also recall that we, we, uh, we took a look at Barker's, um, you, know, uh, 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 you know, some of Barker's formulations from his book Making Sense of Cultural Studies. I will quickly read it, so that you, you can recall it again. Barker says that the constitution of the subject as conceived by cultural studies may be studied under three, uh, three points. Now, A, cultural studies thinks of the subject as a discursive construction. Now, this is what we had discussed just a while ago, okay, the importance of discourse, the importance of language. Second, cultural studies also proposes that we are cultural and political agents. Now, in both in this case, both subjectivity, subjectivity and identity are implied. Okay? When you say or when Barker says or proposes that all of us are cultural and political beings, it means that we are not separately cultural and, poli and political on the one hand and that we are separately, we have our subjectivities and identities. Okay? Our identities and subjectivities are created by the cultural and political scenario in which we live, in which we uh, articulate ourselves and at the same time, now this is the second part of the story, okay? at the same time we are also cultural and political agents. Recall the term we had used uh, a lecture or two ago when we talked about Michel Foucault and the idea of self-fashioning. Okay? Foucault says that just because there is a discourse it does not mean that we are slaves to the discourse. Remember we used, we came across the phrase, there are technologies of the self. Okay? The very discourse in which you are embedded allows you to be an agent of your own articulation of your own subjectivity and identity. So, it is not you know, just a one way process in which we are passive receivers of um, of, uh, of the discourse and the identities and the subjectivities and that, and that they are given, you know, so to speak, in a one way sort of traffic by society. Okay? We are on the other hand also to a large extent arbiters, okay? we are scripters, so to speak, of our own subjectivities and identities. Now, third, now if you look at the slide, this is what Barker says. What is required therefore, is the capacity, now look at this word, the capacity for switching. Okay? So, you have several discourses, remember the discourse of man for instance, created the discourse created by economics okay? uh, as homo economicus, the discourse created by religion as a different sort of a person an entity, the discourse created by, uh, uh, by aesthetics, the discourse created by politics. So, Barker says from it is here that we have to negotiate our freedom. Okay? Now, let us read this again. What is required from us therefore, is the capacity for switching or moving, okay? switching or moving between these languages as appropriate and according, this is very telling, according to our purposes. Okay? So, 
on uh, when whenever required we may move there is a mobility from one discourse to the other. So, the, the situation therefore, is not one is not a flat one dimensional one. Okay. There are several ways in which we can reinscribe our identities and reinscribe rewrite so to speak our uh, subjectivities. Okay. So, I, um, I hope by now it is uh, you know it is clear to us okay, how these key concepts are to be used. Okay. You also recall what Anthony Giddens and we, uh, we, we said that Anthony Giddens is not really a cultural theorist, he is more of a sociologist. Okay. Anthony Giddens even says that identity could be a project it is a project that one could uh, undertake. Remember, we, we agree that we are not pass passive receivers, we are also agents or if I may use the word scriptors okay, of our subjectivities and identities and this could be undertaken as a project. In our social identities, we also found in the last lecture, we have certain normative rights. Okay, we have some rights that are given to us within the framework of the identity that is given to us by society. Okay. By, um, you know, by the same token, because we have rights, we also have certain obligations. Now, these obligations are also normative. Okay, in normative in the sense that there are certain norms that are laid out and within our identities we are supposed to to both have rights and to perform our obligations towards society. Then there are certain sanctions that are given to us. We are expected to play certain roles in society given again the framework of identity within which we operate and there are importantly certain markers that we wear okay, of our identity. Now, these markers are both physical markers, okay, both tangible markers that you and I can see and at the same time they are also mental, intellectual, uh, even emotional markers. Okay. We may use the word symbols for this, there are certain symbols okay, which are the markers which carry our identity. Right? So, if I for instance am a teacher in an institute, uh, and therefore, I have if you look at the slides, I have certain normative rights within the framework of the identity of being a teacher. I have certain obligations okay, to perform as a teacher. I am given certain sanctions. This is a role that I am playing and there are certain markers or symbols that I carry in both in my person and in my uh, behavior okay, which should fall or which should approximate at least okay, uh, the framework of uh, my social identity that is given to us. Right? So, these are of course, this is a very this is a very normative and within this we all negotiate. We are not always uh, the teacher that we are in our classrooms. We are mothers for instance, we are family people, we are political people with certain political beliefs uh, and, and, and various other things. Okay? But, uh, in a way, in a way, essentially speaking, our social identities uh, encompass these uh, these uh, variables. And another important definition that we had seen was between identity and identification. Okay, the the relation between identity and identification, as given by Barker. And look at this slide here. He says, if you recall, identity is an emotionally charged Okay, description of ourselves. It is an emotionally charged. Why? Because we invest so much. Okay. Identity is something which is not devoid of any emo emotions. Okay. If I, I have an identity as a person belonging to a certain part of India or belonging to a certain community, okay, it is but natural that the markers, the symbols of that of my community, okay, the rights, the sanctions, roles of my um, identity as belonging to a certain community would be an emotional one. I would react or respond, respond emotionally uh, in a negative or positive way given the way people respond to my culture 
uh, and community. So, Baka, as he says, identity is an emotionally charged discursive, as he said, uh, saw earlier, discursive or in language description of ourselves that is subject to change. Okay, identity is not once and for all given to us. Hall finally calls identity a temporary and arbitrary closure of meanings. Okay? Now, this is important because there is we see that there it is an open road okay? and every time you describe society describes your identity or you describe your self identity. Remember that this is only this is the word here a temporary one. It is only in even in time and both in time of course, in time and space it is a temporary, um, a temporary closure of meanings. Okay? It is almost an arbitrary one, right? arbitrary in the sense that uh, it is not uh, absolute. Right? So, uh, identity therefore, is a temporary and arbitrary closure of meanings and this closure will open up once we have we are in another temporal and spatial domain. Okay? Uh, this however, here Stuart Hall is not saying that we are one person today and another person tomorrow completely different. Okay? What he is referring to here is uh, the fact that this is negotiable. Okay? You can write the word here, it is negotiable. Right? Though we move there is freedom mobility to move within a certain framework. So, language uh, sorry uh, our description in language is therefore, plastic plastic here means flexible, okay? flexible plastic and anti essentialist in the sense that there is no one essence. Okay? We also saw uh, that the question of identity is important politically. Okay? to create again to recreate an essence. This is very interesting, you know we theoretically we find that um, the uh, you know these theorists have given us, these theorists have given us certain certain, um, uh, certain premises or certain uh, you know certain uh, theoretical articulations in which essence can be done away with okay, because we can negotiate. But there is an interesting corollary here okay is that identity even if you know we we go through the journey of such mobility of recreating ourselves identity can also look at this word recreate a sense okay just a while ago we were uh, we were happy with the fact that we are uh, you know we are not just slaves to what Ident what identity is given to us by society. On the other hand, as seen in certain political uh, movements and ethnic movements, we find that um, it helps in the recreation of essence. We try to say what essentially does it mean to belong to a certain tribe, what essentially does it mean to be you know a teacher in an IIT, what essentially it means to be an Indian and what do we do here? We we again reassert the signs and symbols, the tastes, look at these, the beliefs, the attitudes and the lifestyles of what it means to be uh, a member of a certain community or a tribe or, or uh, you know um, a certain profession. Okay? So, there is almost a dialectic here. The point is we are at once free and the moment we realize that we are free at a certain moment we come back and try to recreate ourselves and again come back into and, and to articulate our essences. So, this is you know the problematic and there are as in cultural studies and in the humanities in, in, in um, particular no clear cut answers. Our job is to problematize, our job is to show the sophistication, the complexity of what it means to live certain lives. So, fine, this is um, what we did by way of uh, you know discussing what went just before this lecture. Uh, I would be devoting two lectures to the topic of ideology, because ideology like identity is again you will almost say the pil uh, a pillar of cultural studies. Okay? It is a theoretical conceptual pillar of uh, cultural studies. Even if I did devote two lectures to, uh, to the concept or uh, topic of ideology would uh, 
the you know it should not be thought that I have exhausted all the possibilities of talking. I haven't even, I wouldn't have even scratched the surface of talking about ideology. However, um, just recalling that this these lectures are meant for uh, you know students uh, students of uh, engineering colleges and that they they you know need to know certain things about what it means to be a human being living in culture okay what are uh, you know what what it you know what are the things that we consume what are the mental artifacts that we consume what are the material artifacts that we consume for such questions an introduction to the concept of ideology is immensely important. Okay. Now, we will go back to perhaps what was our first lecture. Okay. We, I need to bring a slide from my first lecture and to remind you that what we are doing here is new cultural studies, new cultural studies in the sense that we are not, we have come away largely from the old anthropological focus on culture as um, a way of life of, study, of, of studying uh, you know the different habits of people etcetera. We are in a domain uh, which uh, in which words like power okay, in which words like conflict in which words like identity subjectivity ideology okay, discourse um, are given more importance than in the old way of doing cultural studies. Okay. Recall um, Clifford Gates in the interpretation of cultures. Okay. Culture is the webs of significance spun by man that he is suspended in. Recall that as I said earlier, this there is the metaphor of the spider here. Okay. Look at the word webs, right? Suspended in spun. He is using the metaphor of, of the spider here and says that we spin okay we spin culture ourselves it is we who are the creators of culture okay and interestingly we are both the sort of spinners of culture and we are also suspended in that web now here the word suspended also carries the nuances of being trapped so to speak Okay, slightly there is a nuance of being trapped. We are the spinners of our culture and we are also trapped in it. And most importantly is this phrase in, in uh, that is highlighted, uh, culture is the webs of what is the most important word here? Significance. What is significance? Significance here means meaning. Okay. So, the networks or the webs of meaning and value that we created is essentially what culture is in the new way of looking at cultural studies. Okay. So, let me read it once again, culture is a web of significance spun by man that he is suspended in, okay. Clifford Gates in the interpretation of cultures. Second, Stuart Hall, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the definition of culture given by Stuart Hall okay, is uh, you know central to the understanding of cultural studies and I will show how it is central to the understanding of our term today that is ideology. Hall says by culture I mean the actual grounded terrain of practices, representations, languages and customs of any specific society. Okay. Now, you may think that this seems, uh, seems to be uh, quite similar to the old school, okay. but the, the words here that are important here are the actual grounded terrain and the word representation. This is a topic um, which would, to which would be devoted another lecture since it is a key concept and I would not be del delving into it right now, uh, but suffice it for us at this moment to, uh, to understand that according to Hall, okay, it is the actual grounded terrain or the material base, the material terrain on which we have our cultural practices, on which we raise representations of ourselves, of others, okay, on which we use languages and customs. Then he says, the next point, uh, look at this slide, I also mean, he says by culture I mean not simply representations, languages, practices etcetera and the grounded terrain on which these are erected. He says I also mean the contradictory forms of common sense, 
which have taken root in and helped to shape pop popular lives. Okay? The idea of common sense may not be common to all cultures. Hence, he uses the word contradictory. It says every culture has something called common sense, but it is interesting to find that common sense differs from culture to culture. So, these are contradictory and they have taken root number one and number two, they have also shaped our popular and our everyday lives. Culture is not a given. Now, if you look at you know the uh, let us look at the um, the four you know the four key sentences or key you could say propositions of the course that we are doing. Culture is not a given, it is constructed and hence can be studied systematically. Culture is not absolute or static, but changing and dynamic and there are reasons and forces example political economy behind cultural changes and power is the chief arbiter of the kind of lives we lead. Now, these four sentences as we look you know, it is important for us to keep these in mind as we go into the study of ideology. It is interesting that you know the whole domain of cultural studies as Barker says may even be renamed ideological studies. Again such is the importance of the term ideology in cultural studies. Now, this is Chris Barker in the Sage Dictionary of Cultural Studies. He says, so influential has the concept of ideology been within cultural studies that the whole field was once dubbed ideological studies. Okay. Fine. Now, let us look carefully at a few phrases which may be used as definitions of ideology. When you look at the variety of what you know, variety of ideas that are given by these phrases, uh, you have an idea, you have an inkling of how much goes into an understanding of ideology. The fact that the word ideology is a loaded one, okay? it serves to, uh, several purposes in several analysis of culture and society and we need to have a look at them. Well, number one, ideology is a set of ideas. Okay. Ideology is a certain ideas or a set of ideas that you hold okay, in your mind. Right. They are also a set of not just ideas, but ideals. Okay. We all know the difference between ideas and ideals. Ideals are what we hold to be of great value okay, that are to be emulated right? um, that are uh, you know um, that are things that should be our goal as people living in a culture in an, our society. Okay? So, the first by the going by the first definition of ideology we find that ideology is both a set of ideas that we hold in our minds which go on to determine our activities. After all our activities, our behavior as so called you know normal and consistent uh, personalities okay, are based on a set of ideas regarding the world. Okay. More about this a while later and as we saw also these are a set or a collection of ideals or things of of considerable value that we must pursue as our goals. Okay. Second, ideology is also defined as a world view. Okay. There is a word uh, in German uh, which many of you might know is Weltanschauung or which means a world view meaning ideology is how you perceive the world, okay. a world literally a view of the world. Okay, how you view the world. Hmm? So, this world view again is a result of what or how has it been built? The world view as we see was built or has been built or is built by the set of ideas preceding this definition. Okay, number 1, the set of ideas that we hold. Number 3, 
it is also a consciousness right which means that there is a certain uh, here consciousness means a certain awareness a certain way of looking at the world. But this consciousness is not something that simply drops from the heavens or something that we arbitrarily uh, you know uh, use for ourselves it is important and look at this word here please that it is a received consciousness okay you may think that the you know this the set of ideas or the world view you have is completely your own of your own making something that you have sort of chosen okay but it is important to see going by this definition of ideology that it is a consciousness awareness of the world all right but it is a look at this word it is a received one okay which means that it is it is not something which is totally your own construction it is received obviously by what it is received received from us by culture next it is also called a body of doctrine ideology is also called a body of doctrine now this is used you know mostly in uh, in in um, certain uh, what should we say in certain uh, uh, cases of when we talk about rules okay strict rules to be followed which are you know which almost became doctrinaire and it is mostly used in the case of um, of religion okay uh, that there are certain rules by which you abide which are doctrinaire these rules are doctrinaire okay and we are to it is a whole body of knowledge a body of doctrines that we follow. Next ideology is also called a systematic body of concept it is not that it is simply a collection we saw in the first definition a set of ideas it is not uh, it is a set of ideas all right a set of concepts all right but it is important to understand it is not a haphazard chaotic kind of a collection of ideas and concepts it is a systematic one now what do we mean by a systematic one okay here it means that the ideas that we have talked about and the concepts that we talk about cohere you know in a consistent in a rational in a logical sort of way rational and logical I, by, by that I mean to the system that they are creating then they create. So, it seems uh, it, it is it is um, not uh, not possible or it is not not preferable to have to hold contradictory ideas. Okay? So, these when ideas cohere to form a certain system okay, which which looks all to be consistent on its own we also call it an ideology hence ideology is a systematic body of concepts. So, I hope you have understood what it means by systematic okay, that it is not random not arbitrary not chaotic, but it is consistent to the body of beliefs that it creates. Next ideology is also a manner of thinking here manner of thinking means a way of thinking obviously if you hold a certain uh, systematic collection of ideas of concepts okay if you have a world view if you have a consciousness however received okay if you have a body uh, that that becomes almost a doctrine if you have a body of concepts that are systematic obviously you would have a certain way of thinking Okay. And how is this way of thinking determined? This way of thinking is determined by all these have that have gone before this, okay. the ideas you know, cohering together, being consistent, creating a certain consciousness, okay, being um, you know a whole body of concepts etcetera. These are what go into a certain way, a certain style so to speak of your thinking. Finally, and also um, and not the least important is maps of meaning okay ideology is also defined as maps of meaning now how is the word maps used here well, how why how do we use maps so if you are navigating uh, you know uh, if you are in a journey and you are navigating uh, a certain uh, uh, you know uh, a certain itinerary or you know you know you know, you know on, on a journey you use a map okay to find out uh, the roads that you are supposed to travel on. In the same way, okay, uh, ideology is, is also like a map. 
Now, it is a map to what? It is not a map to a certain physical geographical destination. Okay? It is a map to the creation of meaning okay? and I think this last definition of ideology <laughs> is the one that is most important uh, to our understanding of cultural studies from the understanding of culture and what we call the new way of doing cultural studies. They are maps of meaning, they are pointers to meaning. What does this imply? You know, if we to follow from this, what does it mean? It means that your set of beliefs okay, or your set of what we have here ideas and your worldview is therefore also going to determine the meaning since they are the maps, okay, they are the pointers to meaning. It also very importantly follows therefore, that meaning creation is or may not be the same for everyone. Okay? You any 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 uh, you know any cultural artifact may have a different meaning for different persons, right? Uh, an artifact that belongs to a particular community okay, is invested with meaning. A meaning that may not be shared by a visitor from another culture. Okay? So, it may be uh, a mental artifact, it may be a physical material artifact, okay? it may be an idol, it may be a book, uh, it may be a film. Okay? So, the maps of meaning of understanding so to speak of that cultural object or artifact okay, is dependent upon the ideology that you hold. Okay? And this is something that you cannot overstate. It is very important for us to, under, uh, to understand these, uh, particularly the last implication. Therefore, these are the terms quickly that we found that ideology may be called the worldview, uh, consciousness, doctrine, ideas, and maps is important important for us to remember these you know these individual words so that every time we talk about ideology we are not somehow we don't fall into the trap of talking only of one of the various nuances of important nuances of the term ideology um, therefore ideology may be conveniently okay as a first uh, definition be called a set of beliefs and it is also called let us look at the word here. It is also called lenses. Okay? The certain uh, way of looking at the world is like wearing a certain lenses and um, you may change those lenses. Okay? You can look at your own community sorry at your own identity through the lenses of somebody else, somebody else's ideology okay? or somebody uh, else may look at your own uh, identity, culture, subjectivity even okay? uh, by wearing uh, you know uh, so, so to speak the cultural lenses that you are habituated to. So, there is there may, may be what we call an exchange of ideologies or worldviews, which is a good thing. So, that you are not trapped within one set of ideas or one set of concepts um, that may even go on to become a doctrinaire. Okay? doctrinal way of looking at things. Of course, uh, there should not be too much play here as the postmodernists uh, as some, some people say is the bane of postmodernism, okay? but there should be a responsible right? a responsible civil moving in and out of, of different ideologies. So, that you perceive the world in different ways and you are not caught up in any one ideology. Now, how this takes us to another very important question. How uh, you know how are um, how are ideologies institutionalized? You know how do ideologies come to us? And we can talk about three institutionalized processes, okay, or rather three processes of institutionalization of socialization, if you like, of ideology, okay, and they are these three that ideology or the set of values. Remember we had said that this is not something that you create or I create on my own or on your own. It is what remember we said a received consciousness. Now, this received consciousness is A produced okay, by a given culture, B it is distributed through certain cultural actual material cultural artifacts and C it is 
consumed by us. Okay? So, this is a, a very important point here that we have to see how these have been uh, uh, how they are received in the first place. Okay? The, now, you are I know already thinking of well if it is produced then it is produced by whom? Okay? If it is distributed it is distributed by whom and if it is consumed it is consumed by whom. Okay? So, this is something that we will come to a little while later. Um, therefore, it is important for us to remember that ideology uh, the consumption of ideology a, uh, you know is um, or comes to us from uh, a the production of ideology and the distribution of ideology. Now, when we talk uh, I would like to end with uh, you know uh, uh, this point for the first part of this is when we talk about ideologies and we say that ideology is a way you know uh, is a way of looking at the world then it logically follows okay, that in our political arrangements you know, in the way our political lives are organized uh, in our cultures okay, is deeply tied to the concept of ideology. So, much so that we can uh, we have the term called political ideologies. Now, by itself the phrase or the term political ideology would obviously mean what that these are ways of seeing the world okay the ways of uh, you know understanding what life is of understanding what the world is and of understanding what our place in the world is from a political point of view okay now by political here we simply we don't simply mean the vote okay we know by now that the word politics the word politics is deeply entwined with, an, with another word which is to do with power. So, we may ask this in a different way. Okay. Political ideologies explore this seminal question, how is power to be distributed and organized in a society? How much power can or should I have? How much power should a leader in my society have and how much power should the governance have. Okay. Now, let us look at this again. Political ideologies have as their goal an exploration of what is what every ideology feels is the ideal way, okay, the best way, right, the optimum or the optimal way, so to speak of organizing a society. How should we organize a society? Uh, what kind of um, what kind of beliefs should we have about human beings, about other animals, about social structure, about our goals, uh, you know uh, social goals, about our well our spiritual goals uh, and what have you. Okay? So, to encompass all of these in the best and optimum way possible, the question asked by all political ideologies is what is okay, the best social arrangement, where uh, all human beings may, may develop and all human beings may lead a happy life. Okay? Now, this look at the slide, this uh, entails uh, chiefly two things. Okay? One is what form of government should we have? Right? Um, what what are uh, what are what is a what is the ideology that a particular government should have? And secondly, since economics is ultimately the determinant, at least in a, in a from a Marxist perspective, the determinant of so many things in our lives. What are the economic policies that we should have? Okay. So coming to this again, what are political ideologies? Political ideologies are are uh, you know attempts to carve out a, a, an ideal and the best way of organizing ourselves as a polity okay, in which are in which two things are very important one is of governance and one is of economic policies. Now, we let us quickly look at uh, just a, a few there are so many really just a few of what these ideologies are. If I asked you name five or four or five you know ideologies or political ideologies, then you would say something like this. Okay. These are ways of arranging 
uh, you know, society and governance. Liberalism. Liberalism is a political ideology. Capitalism, okay, in which private property, the concentration of wealth in, a, uh, in, a, in the hands of a few are the hallmarks. Capitalism is an ideology. So, is communism, which is its reverse, that is the um, you know a belief that or a world view in which there should not be private property or this property should be wealth should be in a society should be equally divided among all its workers. Then number four environmentalism it, this would be a political ideology in which a major onus or focus or weight is given to the environment okay? and which is of as all of us know is uh, a crucial question today. Feminism or um, equal rights, so to speak, in a, of course, in a very simplistic sort of way, equal rights to people, to uh, to uh, to women, um, law, you know, uh, as is given uh, given to men, uh, uh, is an important factor, and uh, anarchism, okay, which is um, essentially a belief uh, in um, in a society where there is no state, okay. And uh, is also another political ideology. So the, this, my first lecture was, you know, uh, on ideology was really opening up the important, um, you know, the other important concepts and slightly delineating the scope of that. Okay. Fine. Now uh, we wrap up this lecture by asking uh, just you know, one or two questions on what we have, uh, you know, be, been through till now. If you get a question like this. Enumerate the various ways in which ideology may be defined or understood. We have I think dealt uh, quite at length at uh, you know the nuances of uh, uh, the term and uh, the, var the various entailments of the term ideology. You would then write an answer depending on the you know the, the weightage of the marks. You would write an answer which would encompass these points and we learned that ideology may be defined in several ways and a few important ways are enumerated here that is ideology is a set of ideas and also a set of ideals. Uh, it is a world view or as we said this is a, what, what in German is called Weltanschauung. It is a received consciousness meaning it is not just an awareness that we think we have developed, it is an illusion to think that we have developed it ourselves, it is received. Okay usually in, uh, you know uh, usually in by the society and culture that we live in received through media received through through our seniors received through books etc okay it is a body of doctrine in the sense that it ideology may go on as in we find in religion to be quite doctrinaire okay or sometimes even rigid in its in its rules it is a body of doc, uh, sorry concepts that is systematic uh, remember to focus on the term systematic that is they cohere to form a system. It is a manner of thinking, a way of thinking which is determined by all that has gone before this and most importantly ideology is, ideology is something that goes into creating meaning and so much so that we call it maps of meaning, they are pointers to meaning creation. And we also saw that it can we can call ideology a set of lenses through which we see the world. How is an ideology institutionalized? Ideology is institutionalized through the processes of or through the institutions of producing, distributing then ultimately which leads to the consumption of ideology. So, well um, this is the end of part 1 of uh, ideology and I would uh, then have uh, maybe a, a one lecture and if well if I find it necessary maybe we'll go on to a third lecture uh, because there is a lot of material that I need to do and remember cultural studies was at one point of time called ideological studies and such is the importance of ideology and um, thank you very much and in the next lecture we shall see or we shall talk about a more some more things relating to ideology. Thank you. <laughs>